All right. And then we're also going to get our uh, Facebook link going too. Are we are we live on Facebook? Right now. Uh, I'll double check. Yes, I see the video, so we should be live. Excellent. And we'll just take a moment as people are logging in. Do you want me to share screen now, or should I wait until you're done with the introductions? Either way is fine. Yeah. Cool. Maybe we can do after introductions, because I think when the screen sharing starts, it's only one person's video that shows up, from what I remember. Yeah, sounds good. So we'll just take a moment. Uh, folks are logging in. Thanks everyone for tuning into Science Bubble tonight. Just take a moment here. Um, just as our program is getting started, um, I just wanted to thank you for tuning in. Um, this is the Berkeley Public Library hosting Popping the Science Bubble. Um, and we just enjoy having this partnership and giving the community opportunity to learn about the research of Cal students and postdocs every month. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and read the Berkeley Public Library land acknowledgement. Um, so even though this is a virtual program, we do, we do want to acknowledge the land that the library sits on. Um, the Berkeley Public Library acknowledges that we sit on the unceded traditional lands of the Ohlone people. We honor with gratitude the land itself, as well as the Ohlone people who still live, work, and play in this region. The Berkeley Public Library condemns all forms of hatred, racism, and other forms of discrimination. We are outraged and saddened at the surge of hate crimes towards Asian American communities, as well as the racism that has been shown towards African American communities. We stand in solidarity with all marginalized people that have been subjected to hatred and intolerance and celebrate the differences that contribute to the strength of our community. Everyone is welcome here at the Berkeley Public Library. Right. Okay. And Yeah, and we're just really excited. Um, we're excited to have two plant themed topics um, this month. Um, over the grant summer, the library has been hosting our pollinator programs. Um, I think last week we did the last one in the series officially, but we made a lot of partnerships and we'll plan to do more pollinator program events, but it is so exciting to be talking about plants today. All right, I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, or not our speakers, but our library program. So Popping the Science Bubble is a monthly seminar series. Um, it happens on the third Tuesday of the month at 5.30 p.m. every month. Um, and the goal of Popping the Science Bubble is to share new research findings from grad students and postdocs at UC Berkeley with the general public and create constructive discussion about a variety of science topics. We have two speakers at each seminar who will talk about their current research or a topic they find really interesting. The organizers are three graduate students at UC Berkeley, Jenna, Madison, and Oksana. 
If you're interested in checking out past seminars, you can visit their website and their YouTube page, which has a fantastic archive, as well as their Twitter and Facebook page. And I encourage you to sign up for the listserv and keep in the loop for upcoming seminars. Um, thank you so much for logging in uh, tonight. And I'll go ahead and let the Science Bubble team introduce tonight's speakers. Thanks, Kelsey, for the introduction. And before we get started with our first speaker, we like to remind our audience members that we encourage questions um, any time during the talk. You can just type your question in the Q&A chat or chat box, and one of us will ask our questions live for you. And then if you're watching the Facebook channel, you can also um, comment your question there, and we'll also be monitoring um, the Facebook live stream. Um, and so, okay, I'll stop sharing my screen so that I can introduce our first speaker, Monica. Um, so Monica grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She worked as a researcher at several agricultural biotechnology startups in Boston before starting her PhD position at Cal. She loves any and all disc sports, including ultimate frisbee and disc golf. And so with that, let's welcome Monica. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, let me know if you have any issues seeing it. We're seeing the um, presenter view. Okay, let me try that again. <laughs> How about now? Great. Okay, awesome. All right, great. So thanks for joining today. Um, as the introduction mentioned, I'm a PhD student at Cal. I'm in my third year and I study plant disease evolution. And so I'll share more about that today. So when people think of grapevine growing regions of California, this is obviously a really big one in the state. Um, people typically think of Napa and Sonoma, but actually grapevines are grown all across the state of California, um, both along the coast and throughout the Central Valley. Um, and so grapevine production is really important to the state's economy and identity, and it kind of spans a really wide geographic area. And as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of different climates. So in California, the South, uh, Central Valley is really warm, um, it's a little bit colder up north, and the climate varies a lot in this range. Can anyone, and feel free to throw it in the chat, think of any challenges uh, to grapevine cultivation in California? Water, yeah, water is a big one. Definitely if you drive down the middle of California, you see a lot of signs about dams and Irrigation is really a big issue for a lot of uh, growers. Ash from fires, yeah, that's a good one. Definitely um, with fires, uh, the smoke from the fires can make the grapes unusable. And so that can kind of um, ruin a whole season for a lot of growers. And yeah, disease is a great one too. And that's a great segue into my next slide. So thank you, Chandler. <laughs> so I study one specific disease of grapevines. It's uh, a bacterial disease. The name of the bacterium is Xylella fastidiosa. And the disease is Pierce's disease of grapevines. So on the Left-hand side, you can see what it looks like when I grow the bacterium in the lab. And all of these little white dots are millions of cells of bacteria. And so this is what it looks like when I actually grow them in the lab. So what does this bacterium do in the plant? Well, it kind of clogs up um, the vessel. So it makes it hard for the plant to move water and nutrients. And so as the bacterial populations grow, it can, um, make it really hard for the plant to get sufficient um, nutrients. And so in the middle, you see some of the symptoms of Pierce's disease. You see these shriveled grapevines, which obviously aren't great for making wine. Um, and you see discoloration of the leaves and it looks a little crunchy on the end. And this is because uh, again, it's not getting enough water. And so you see these symptoms, especially late in the season after an accumulation of um, a dry season. 
so then thinking about where we talked about where grapevines are grown in California. And then let's think, talk about a little bit of the distribution of Pierce's disease in California. So um, Pierce's disease was first identified in the late 1800s in Anaheim. And Anaheim is right outside of Los Angeles in Southern California. And since then, oops, um, since then Pierce's disease has spread throughout the state of California, all the way up through Napa and Sonoma. However, some early research found that Pierce's disease doesn't survive in cold winters. And in Mendocino County, it gets a lot colder. And so you can imagine an imaginary line where the winter gets a lot colder. And some previous studies found that when it gets really cold in the winter, the bacterium doesn't survive. So the line is an oversimplification. The climate just doesn't change that starkly across this line. But the principle holds that in this region in Mendocino, there wasn't a lot of Pierce's disease in the past. So here it is zoomed in. And you can see that although it's geographically close to Napa and Sonoma, um, historically there wasn't a lot of Pierce's disease in Mendocino, and this was attributed to the climate. But in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot more of Pierce's disease in Mendocino County. And this is a problem because it is, um, there are a lot of vineyards there and it's kind of, intriguing because it wasn't there in the past. And so this motivation um, has been motivating my research. And a lot of the people who are growing grapes in this area are curious about why this is happening, both for economic and scientific reasons. So let's talk a little bit about why this might be happening. So I think a lot of people are familiar with climate change, and that's definitely one thing that could be contributing to this. So as I mentioned the, of the past research of how uh, winter survival affected um, the survival of Pierce's disease, in Mendocino County, in a study that went from 1999 to 2000, vines that were uh, infected with Pierce's disease, none of them survived the winter. And in the same um, study in Napa, 67% of vines that had this bacterium survived over the winter. And so, like I mentioned, although they're not that far away from each other, Napa and Mendocino, they have very different winter temperatures. And so on the right, you can see graphing the minimum temperature over 12 months for Mendocino on the red line and Napa in the blue line. And what's really obvious, I think, is this uptick in the last um, 20 to 15 years. And so um, climate change definitely might have something to do with uh, the survival going above 0% uh, for Pierce's disease in Mendocino County. And the other thing that might be going on is that bacteria, uh, their bacteria are living organisms, they evolve and they can adapt to new climate conditions. So um, I like to think about this first, maybe in terms of plants. Uh, and if you're in Southern California, you expect to see palm trees and palm trees you think of as warm weather, um, very balmy, but you might still see palm trees in the Bay Area because it doesn't get that cold in the winter. But around Lake Tahoe or, South, or Northern California, you would expect to see more pines and spruce trees or other coniferous trees that are better adapted to live um, in those colder winters. And so these plants diverged millions of years ago. But what's cool about studying bacteria is that these adaptations to different climates can happen on the scale of decades rather than millions of years. And so using this analogy to think about what's happening with the bacteria that I study, Xylella fastidiosa, um, there can be different types of this bacterium even within California. So when I say there's different strains, I just mean a subtype of the same species. It's all the same species, but there's different populations that might differ in their biological properties. So um, Bakersfield is in the South Central Valley and a strain from there um, might have different properties than a strain from Mendocino County. And I include a question mark here because we're not sure if this strain from Mendocino County um, has adapted to survive these colder winters. Uh, is there a question? Yeah, there is a question, Monica, sorry. Um, so Sarah asks, can vines develop an immune response over time? Yeah, for sure. So um, in with grapevines, there's different, uh, 
there's a lot of different varieties, like, you know, Merlot and Pinot Noir and all the different types of varieties. And they actually defer in their ability to mount an immune response against this pathogen. And so because um, vines are often cloned to start new vineyards, it's not that like the plants are evolving, but different varieties might have different immune responses to this pathogen. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, I'm gonna move on, but I'm happy to answer uh, additional questions. Great. Um, so we were talking about this hypothesis that Xylella may have adapted to survive cold winter temperatures in California. And so to, to actually test this, um, the experiment that I set up in collaboration with a lot of people in my lab was to put a strain from Bakersfield, which is from the South Central Valley, and a strain that I collected from Mendocino County that could be um, adapted to these colder winters and put them both at a, a UC research station in Mendocino County. So on the red dot is where the research station is. Um, and there was an experimental vineyard that was there that was going to be retired, but my lab was able to get uh, funding to be able to run this experiment. And this is really exciting because for obvious reasons, it's hard to get a vineyard to be able to infect. A lot of growers don't want you to go there and put a disease in their uh, vines. But um, from a scientific perspective, it's exciting because we can learn a lot from doing this. So in this adaptation hypothesis uh, scenario, we think that uh, if it's true that Mendocino strain is adapting to colder winter temperatures, that strain should be able to survive the winter at higher rates than the Bakersfield strain. Um, alternatively, if it's mostly climate change that's driving this, the Mendocino and Bakersfield strains will survive the winter at equal rates. Because of climate change, it might not be 0% survive, it might be a little bit higher than that, um, but we wouldn't see a difference in the two strains if they don't have different adaptations. So let's see what happened. Um, and so here's some pictures and you can kind of get a sense of the scale of what it's like to infect over 500 vines. So these are some of my colleagues and the professor I work with actually in the vineyard. We had little tubes um, of the bacteria and you like literally poke them into the plant to infect the plant. And then uh, across last year and throughout this summer, we go back to the um, vineyard and collect plant samples to test in the lab. Testing in the lab is just like when you go and get um, a test for if you have COVID or not, and hopefully you don't, but it's running a PCR on that sample. And so in the lab, we collect these plant samples and we run a similar PCR um, experiment to see if the plant has the disease. So um, a lot of these molecular techniques are kind of conserved in different areas of science. Great, so in the first year, so this was in the summer of 2021, we saw similar infection rates from the Bakersfield and the Mendocino strain. So this was like in the first year, there hasn't been any winter yet. So this was kind of expected. In the control, we had a bunch of plants that we just infected, infected with water and none of those were positive. So that was really good. Um, and for the other two treatments, we saw around 50% were positive. Um, again, this is actually from the vineyard. We saw these symptoms. The shoot that we infected was really dry. You see these dry berries kind of over on the left compared to the like juicier looking berries in the middle. Um, and so sometimes the symptoms can even be isolated to one part of the vine. And so then this summer is year two. And in July, I went out and tested all of the vines that were positive last year to see of those vines that were positive last year, um, how many infections were surviving the winter. So um, what we see is that there are actually really different winter survival rates in the Bakersfield and Mendocino strain. So in the Mendocino strain from the infections from last year, 50% were still present this year. And in the Bakersfield strain, uh, only 13% uh, survived the winter and were still positive this year. Um, and it's really hard to do field biology at a really large scale. So while this result may not seem super different to some people, uh, as someone who does field biology and put like years of work into this, it's really exciting to be able to do research at this scale and, and see these kinds of things. 
So um, this, we're going to continue to monitor these vines like throughout the season and over next year to continue to look at winter survival. But um, for right now, it does seem like there's a big difference between the Mendocino and the Bakersfield strain as far as winter survival. And you'll also notice that, you know, in the past, I mentioned in this study from 2000, 0% were surviving. But even in the Bakersfield strain, there's 13% that are surviving. So that is really different from what was found even in 2000. So um, yeah, so, so in conclusion, the data do suggest that the Mendocino strain has adapted to survive cold winters. It does seem like there's a biological difference between the strain from Mendocino and the strain from Bakersfield, especially at surviving the winter. And why that is will require a lot more work in the lab and hopefully that can continue throughout my dissertation. But at least right now we have this result that suggests there's a biological difference between them. Uh, and just because that there's adaptation doesn't mean that climate change isn't playing a role. Climate change definitely still is playing a role in the expansion of this bacterium, but it's not an either or scenario. Uh, it's definitely, uh, it could be both. So there could be adaptation in the bacterium and as the climate's changing, you see more of the disease in this region. And just um, to finish up quickly, to understand uh, differences between strains is really important for understanding the risk of plant diseases worldwide. So what a lot of people will do when they're trying to model risk of disease is look at where the bacterium occurs. So for example, on the left, cellula occurs in mostly the Southern United States, and then use where it is and those climates to predict the climates that it might be suitable. So in Europe, they're worried about introductions of this pathogen um, to a lot of places there. And so they build models of what climates might be suitable for Pierce's disease. So it really does matter if you build those models thinking of a strain like the Bakersfield strain versus a strain like the Mendocino strain. So understanding the biology of um, the climate tolerance of different strains matters for assessing the risk of whether what would happen when they're introduced to a new place. Great, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people in my lab and we had funding from the California Department of Food and Agriculture and I had additional funding from my department. Um, there were many, many people who helped with the field work and the lab work we have. Um, a whole uh, bunch of awesome undergrads and visiting students who are some of whom are pictured here. So it's really been a group effort and uh, thanks for having me and I'm excited to take any questions. Thanks for the nice talk, Monica. Um, yeah, and so oh, it looks like we have a question right away here. Um, so how does the immune system of plants differ from mammals? and do infected plants help spread the disease? Cool, um, I'll answer the second one first. So the disease is actually spread through insect vectors. Um, and I didn't get into that in this talk, but plenty of people, other people in my lab who are more on the entomology side of things, so they study bugs, uh, are interested in how those bugs transmit the bacteria. And so, but you can imagine that, you know, when there's more infected plants, there's more um, disease going around that is able to then be spread by the insects that are feeding on those plants. And so the insects um, actually suck the sap out of the plant. And then when they go to suck the sap out of another plant, they incidentally move the bacterium into that plant. Um, so infected plants uh, aren't directly spreading the disease, but yes. Um, and then does, how does the immune system of plants differ from mammals? Well, um, plants like their immune system, and I'm sure Chandler will talk about this a lot more, um, kind of have systems to detect specific molecules that are conserved across uh, a lot of different bacteria or fungi. So bacteria sometimes have these little tails that help them swim called flagella. And so those are common across multiple different pathogens. And so plants will um, have systems to sense those. And so a lot of plant immune systems are trying to target conserved signals because there's so many different pathogens out there that they kind of need to target um, specific 
ones. Um, so I can't really speak much to mammal immune systems. And I think Chandler will talk more about plant immune systems, but that's my brief primer on it for now. Awesome, thanks, Monica. And to follow up on the question, on that part of the question about um, transmission. Um, so like for your um, actual field site, how did you protect your control plants from being infected um, by yeah. you know, bugs? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so usually what happens is there's not a lot of vine to vine transmission. It's a lot of actually like the plants that are surrounding the vineyard is where the bugs pick it up. And so in a vineyard, you'll often see the diseased vines are the ones that are on the edges of the vineyard or vineyards that are close to riparian, so like river ecosystems. And that's where the bugs like to kind of hang out and overwinter. And sometimes they'll just go into the edges of the vineyard. And so there isn't a lot of vine to vine um, spread. It's a lot of from other plants. So that is one reason that I'm continuing to test all of the control plants. And I'll be able to, using some lab techniques, be able to know um, if it was the Mendocino strain, the Bakersfield strain, or an external strain. So if I do have a control plant that becomes positive over the course of the experiment, I'll have to do a little bit more digging um, to get into like exactly what happened. So it's not a non-zero risk, but um, I'll continue to monitor for that. Okay, I hope your control plants are don't get infected for as long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Monica, can I, I ask a question about, I know you said that like all of these grapes are clonal, which obviously helps you. So they haven't like evolved different immune functions, mm -hmm. but do you ever see like difference in hardiness based on temperature? Like do plants have any like Obviously the bacteria might be more susceptible to like cold versus hot, but like is the plant particularly affected or better at dealing with infections when cold? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's an interesting question because the mechanism of the bacterium not surviving the winter isn't, it's not totally clear whether it's just the bacteria is not good at surviving in cold temperatures or it's some sort of during the winter the plant has some sort of response that maybe it's producing some toxin or like in the winter the ph of the sap changes and that's what causes the bacterium to not survive so there could be this interact interaction of like temperature and plant and in that case it really would make a difference like what type of vine it's in um and so that is an interesting question that some other grad students in my lab are working in, like what specifically is the mechanism of this winter survival? Is it just like temperature and bacteria or is it some other plant mediated response? Cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll round up this um, first talk with one more question, um, but also if you think of more questions afterward, feel free to um, type in the chat to Monica and Monica will be able to answer. Um, so I guess I was thinking a little bit more about um, how your work intersects with like agricultural and policy sort of work. Mm -hmm. um, has your group, um, I guess, been able to like interact with people working in the vineyards and off like exchange information on this disease specifically or even other types of diseases broadly? Yeah, so we work with a lot of um, like Berkeley has a lot of extension services. And so the reason that we were aware of this increasing incidence uh, of Pierce's disease in, Cal in Mendocino was because the extension specialists who were working there were going to the scientists like who work with them and they were like, this is, we don't know why this is happening. We don't know why this is happening. We need to like figure out why. Um, and so that was kind of, it was kind of brought up by concerns from growers and extension specialists. And so um, because this work is funded through the California Department of Food and Agriculture, like each year I also present at their 
conference with updates about it. And so that conference is more geared towards um, growers and people who are actually more into agriculture. Okay, wow, that's really cool. Um, thanks again, Monica, for sharing about your research and the work that you're doing. Great. And um, yeah, so with that, I'll hand it over to Madison. Hi, uh, great job, Monica. Uh, thank you so much. And we're excited uh, to also have Chandler Sutherland here uh, to speak to us also about plant disease. So hopefully Monica's got us in that gear uh, and we're excited to hear what Chandler has to say. Uh, a little bit about Chandler. She grew up in Campbell, so a city just south of San Jose here in the Bay Area. Uh, she became interested in studying the natural world during her freshman year high school biology course, uh, but growing up during the longest drought in California as a native also meant that she became very aware and concerned about climate change. Um, but in college, she found a way to unite these interests uh, in plant biology which has allowed her to use biological tools to improve crop resilience against climate change. She is currently a third year graduate student in the Krasileva lab studying how to keep plants healthy. Uh, and outside of the lab, she enjoys surfing, backpacking, and delicious pastries. So we are excited to hear about her work in plant immune systems. Thank you, Madison. And thank you so much, Monica. I think it's really interesting how we're answering a lot of the same questions in their research, but you're out in the field, I'm in the lab, you're studying grapes, I use model systems, of which I'll get into a little more in my presentation, but I just think it's really interesting. And we're in different departments. Um, very, it's funny how science works like that, but um, <laughs> I am excited to talk to you all today about how plants manage to stay green. Um, thinking about this in terms of plant immune systems, plant immunity, and on more of the molecular level, how plants are able to defend themselves against these pathogens that are trying to eat their harder nutrients and all the chemicals they work so hard photosynthesizing to create. Um, if you're a Bay Area gardener, I'm sure you're familiar with blight and lots of the different bacterial, fungal, the squirrels eating your garden, like all of these things that attack plants every single day. And um, while they're really frustrating if you're a hobby gardener, oh, let me skip right here really quick. Um, they can also have really devastating impacts on our food systems at a greater level. And so um, this top left photo is a picture of rice blast, which is a really devastating fungal pathogen. And when I say pathogen, I mean any bacteria um, or fungus that is attacking plants, any sort of disease that plants can get, I'll refer to as a pathogen. And so rice blast is a really common pathogen that destroys almost half of our world's rice production. Um, the Irish potato famine is one of the most well-known uh, blights that has occurred and really destroyed um, a really important food system. And in general, like wheat and other types of crops are all at risk for these different diseases. And so studying plant immune systems and how plants are able to defend themselves in the wild, in this bottom right picture, we see this you know, very verdant jungle. Like plants are really great at defending themselves in their natural environment. So using some of these tools that plants have developed for themselves in nature that may, maybe we've lost in the domestication process of agriculture is a big part of my research. And so I do just wanna pop back, this is my lab. We all study plant immunity or the pathogens that in, infect plants, including my professor, Ksenia Krasileva, right here. Uh, this was us about a week ago on the beach in Asilomar talking about the future of our lab, which was a really wonderful time to reflect and talk about science and how plants defend themselves and the actual diseases that attack the plants. And so the reason why we do this, the reason we study this, the reason we were on that gorgeous beach was how do we decrease the 40% of global crop production that is lost to disease and pests? Like that is a huge amount of investment of resources and time and energy that is being lost that could be used to be fed, to be feeding people. However, hope is not lost. Plants are marvelous at self-defense. And so studying and understanding their innate abilities to defend themselves is a really exciting application of plant biology for the future of agriculture. 
And so my plan for our time together is to first give a primer of what the plant immune system is, hopefully answering that question we got in the last seminar, and then starting to understand how plants are able to recognize new pathogens, new diseases that are attacking them, um, and getting into that nitty gritty of how they're actually able to evolve at the protein level. And so I wanna introduce you to our cast of characters. Um, on the left is our pathogen, our microorganism that is causing disease. It's evil, it's trying to attack our crops, our plants, the like house plants we love, the crops we rely on. Um, and our dear plant, who we are, our main, our hero, this story. And so our deer plant is a castle in that it is full of resources. It's producing a lot of nutrients and chemicals and sugars through all of its hard work with photosynthesis. And our pathogen is trying to steal and eat those um, for itself. And if I was maybe a uh, microbiologist, someone who studies bacteria, in my head, I would think of the pathogen as our hero just trying to get by in the world. But I'm a plant biologist, so the plant is the hero here. Um, all good castles have moats, so I want to start with the physical defenses that plants have to be able to protect themselves against these invaders. Um, we can think about things we can see, including waxy coats, the bark on trees, and thick cell walls. All of these things deter invaders and help protect our plant and prevent the pathogen from even beginning to like sink its teeth and get inside the plant cell. Um, however, our pathogen invader invaders evolve very quickly and have come up with ways to get around this. Um, leaves need pores for gas exchange, and so often uh, invaders like our pathogen will exploit those pores. That's the drawbridge coming down. They're able to walk right in when the plant is exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, some fungi have even developed ways to imply a in very impressive amounts of pressure to just like force their way through the cell wall. That would be like a catapult coming across, breaking down that cell wall with physical pressure. And plenty of pathogens have developed tolerances for the antimicrobials that plants release. You can think about this as like putting on a gas mask and preventing themselves from being poisoned by some of those antimicrobials that plants are producing at a baseline. Um, and so, if we've been able to breach the physical defense, we may move into the actual immune system. And the key to immunity is recognition. Keeping an immune system running at full force is costly and it's not conducive to happy plants. We can think about this, you know, when we get sick, you get a fever, you get sluggish, a lot of your um, energy and resources are going towards fighting off whatever is attacking you and maintaining that state when you don't need to is a waste of resources and plants operate similarly. And so they want to activate the immune system only when it's necessary. And so the key to immunity and being able to activate this immune system is being able to recognize that you're being attacked. And this is a little bit what Monica mentioned about like recognizing that like swimming tail flagella protein. If you can recognize that, you're sure that that's not your own cell, you can start to activate your immune system and put those precious resources towards defense. And so once a pathogen is recognized, the immune system is very swiftly deployed. Um, and there are two types of pathogen recognition. General pathogen recognition, which is things like recognizing oh, there's a flagellin protein, that's a bacterial swimming mechanism, that's not a plant thing. Um, or there's specific pathogen recognition. But other types of general pathogen recognition, we can return to our siege metaphor a little bit. Uh, the walls have fallen, our invader has secured a position on the leaf and begins to attempt entry. And so recognizing these flagellin things, recognizing cell wall damage is a way that plants are able to recognize that something's wrong and they should start activating that immune response um, and begin to do some of these things that we would uh, understand as a part of the plant immune system, including releasing hormones, releasing more antimicrobials, and even just killing the cell to prevent acquisition of resources and nutrients. And so once a pathogen is able to avoid some of these general pathogen recognition responses, either by uh, suppressing the plant immune system or evolving to avoid recognition at all, we can move on to the specific pathogen recognition in which the plant or the pathogen has gained entry into the cell and starts secreting lots of different proteins to truly take over. This is like the final battle. 
And this is what my lab studies, because this involves intracellular proteins that are able to bind specifically to new pathogen molecules. And this is the real evolutionary arms race at the core of my project. The pathogens are evolving quite quickly. They divide almost every 20 minutes. Um, their fast replication cycle and small genome means that they can evolve very quickly. Whereas if you think about a plant, even some plants like oak trees or redwood trees, they're you would think they would have a much slower opportunity to evolve because they are so old and don't have that same kind of quick replication timing that the bacteria do. Um, and so the bacteria are trying to avoid recognition. The plants are trying to continue to recognize them and be able to turn on their immune systems. And so this is kind of the general core tenet of um, the question of how are plants able to continue evolving new recognition specificities. And so I don't want it to seem like the plants are at this, they're at this disadvantage, but they're very successful in the field. And so understanding how they're able to evolve new recognition specificities without this short replication cycle, without a like small genome, with really high fidelity DNA repair is the central question. And they're really good at it. And so that's what I've been studying in my PhD is understanding how they're able to evolve and be able to continue recognizing because we know that recognition is the key to immunity. Once they recognize, they're able to release their hormones, put up the defense signals, produce antimicrobials, and as I mentioned before, start to like really kill off resources. Um, this is a major difference between our immune systems and plant immune systems. If a plant, it kind of is like cutting off your own leg. Like that's a really dramatic response for a human. Like if you have some infection in your leg, cutting off your leg is a really dramatic response. For a plant, losing a leaf is a less dramatic response. And so in this actual picture of rice blast, the dead spots you're seeing is a part of the plant immune response. It is killing its own cells with the hope that the bacteria will starve and kind of stop the attack. And so that can be a strategy in this game of plant immunity and defense. And so I've given a brief overview of what the plant immune system is. We talked about the physical defenses, like the strong cell wall, the waxy coating. And then once you break through that physical defense, the general recognition where you're trying to recognize things lots of bacteria or fungi or insects have in common, um, and then the specific recognition where if a pathogen has evolved to evade that first layer of defense and shoot proteins into the cell, how do you recognize that you're being attacked? And then once you recognize it, how do you activate that immune system? Producing hormones, um, producing antimicrobials, antifungals, um, and just eventually killing the cell as a last resort. And so moving on to that question of how do plants recognize new pathogens? It's a race for recognition. You're in this evolutionary arms race where if the pathogen can avoid detection, it will continue to proliferate. Um, and if the plant can't keep up, it will you know, be overcome by these pathogens and not survive. And so it really is just a continual arms race. It's often referred to as like in Alice in Wonderland, you're running at full speed, but you're staying in place. Like you have to continue evolving to be able to recognize each other either the bacteria avoiding recognition and the plant continuing to recognize. And so evolution is driven by natural selection acting on mutation. And mutation can be natural variation in our DNA. Um, and because of that natural variation, maybe we'll have different outcomes. Like all of us have very different DNA and that's part of why we're all very different physiologically and lots of other reasons. But part of why we got here is there were some advantageous traits that came about from random mutation that made our you know, ancestors years and years and years ago more fit to their environments. And those were therefore like they reproduced. It was natural selection acting on this random mutation. And so the same thing is happening in plants. There's mutation across their genomes and natural selection occurring on that is what allows them to proliferate in these favorable traits to move through a population. And so in the, that's a lot of evolution like theory all at once, but in the case of immunity, if you have one plant in a population that's able to recognize a new disease, that's a really favorable trait. It can turn on its immune system, hopefully overtake the disease and then survive and 
produce seed and proliferate. And so in the case of immunity, we're looking at where are the mutations happening and how is natural selection affected on them. And so when we think about this in terms of our back and forth, the pathogen's evolving really fast, it's dividing very quickly, and so it has a lot of opportunities for new mutations, whereas the plant is dividing a little more slowly. And so how do plants keep up is the central question. How are they able to continue this? And so how I like to study this is catching mutations as they happen. And so every single cell in our bodies has a slightly different genetic code because from the point at which we were, you know, a single cell uh, zygote to our fully formed like millions of cells, every single one of those divisions is an opportunity for mutation. And so in plants, when you look at a gorgeous, you know, several hundred dollar Monstera uh, white tiger like this one, you can actually see these variations in coloration. And where these are coming from in these patches on the leaf is mutations in the chloroplast or the ability of the plant to produce green pigment. And so those are all individual mutations within the leaf. Um, and so this is a really great way to visualize it. There's like different populations within a single leaf that have different um, mutations and different kind of genetic code. And so I'm interested in this, not so much in this like gorgeous way you can see it, but in the case of in the immune receptors. And so I can't just look at the leaf and see where the mutations are happening. I have to sequence. And so I'll grind up all the DNA from my plant and I'll run it on what's called a nanopore. And a nanopore is this uh, new device in DNA sequencing technology that is actually a protein pore, as you can see in this little graphic on the right. And it expands and contracts around each individual nucleotide and reads out an electrical signal that can be translated back into a DNA code, kind of the like A, C's, T's, and G's that we know and love. And so I will take individual leaves, grind them up and sequence them to see mutations as they're happening in the plant. So we can better understand this process of mutation or mutations occurring and then natural selection acting on them, specifically at immune receptors. And so this is just another way to look at this uh, DNA or this protein pore that's expanding and contracting around the DNA molecule. And so thinking about my plant and our clonal populations of DNA, I'm able to get this sequencing information and begin to see where in the genome mutations happen more frequently, potentially um, at these immune receptors, maybe they are hot spots for mutation. And that's part of how plants are able to keep up in this evolutionary arms race. And so kind of looking back at how I'm tackling this question, I'm interested in this continuous race for recognition between the plants and the pathogens. And if evolution is natural selection occurring on mutation, where are these mutations happening and at what rate, specifically at these receptors that uh, plants are able to use to bind to new diseases? So yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate this time. And I hope next time you're walking around your garden and you see these spots, you start to think about how the plants might be trying to evolve to recognize them. Great, thank you so much, Chandler. Uh, we're happy to open chat and Q&A as always to any questions, but I might kick us off. Um, I'm, I guess, obviously it's nice to look at mutations as they're happening, but then you'd like to know that those mutations are specifically working to help keep a leaf better, uh, have better protection against infection, uh, which obviously you can't know if you have like ground up the leaf before to sequence it. Um, do you generally infect different plants or infect different leaves? And you're looking at what rate the infection increases before you sequence or like on what scale are you, are you looking, is this plant or leaf or sorry, if this is a overall no, question. That's, but, no, it totally makes sense. Um, in my interest in, I mean, mutations when they occur, there's they're more likely to be deleterious. Like they're more likely to hurt the plant than they are to help the plant. And that's true with most mutations. Like most mutations will like totally disrupt your protein, like be disasters. And that's just kind of how 
mutation happens to be because most genes and proteins are encoding for really important things. And so immunity and immune reception is a really rare case where a high mutation rate is favorable because you need to be constantly evolving to find new things. And so in like human immunity, there's active mutation at like your antibody DNA sequence to be able to bind to new things. And so that first part of your question, like most mutations that happen in an immune receptor are going to be either like ruin its function. And so it can't recognize what it was recognizing before or make it an autoactive uh, receptor. So like the immune system's always on, the plant always has a fever. Um, and so the way I've been going about this, I'm interested also if pathogen exposure can increase the mutation rate and then where these mutations are happening. And so my current experimental design is to take a young plant and to sequence a few leaves from the bottom to see what the baseline um, level of mutation is. And then apply a pathogen pressure. I like spray them down with like really healthy, happy liquid pathogen and then allow them to grow. And as these new leaves are formed, I'll grind those up and look at the mutation rate. And so I'm looking on a within plant level. And part of that is because I'm interested in mutation. I want to avoid selection as much as possible. And it's really hard to get selection within a single plant because there's not like the selection of like, oh, uh, like seed can't make a new plant or like this plant survived better. And so I'm looking really within a single organism level. Cool, thank you. Uh, and then one of our attendees is asking, are some plant varieties more adept than others at fighting disease? For example, tropical plants or lawn weeds, which of course we all know are not as easy to kill as maybe we'd like. <laughs> Definitely. Um... I, that's a good question. I don't, there's, there's a couple of ways to think about this. And so I mentioned a lot that pathogens are evolving really quickly because they're able to divide super fast. And so things like weeds or tropical plants typically have shorter lifespans. And so anytime you're like reproducing very quickly and having a lot of offspring, you have a lot of opportunity for new variants to arise in a population. And so this is part of why like, your weeds are evolving quite quickly. Um, and then also if you're applying a really strong selection, like you're spraying Roundup every year and you like kill 99% of your plants, but like one of them survives and they're able to reproduce, then that's kind of, it's the same thing about when you think about like things that are attacking us developing like antibiotic resistance. It's a little bit of that same idea. Like if it only takes like one really hardy weed that can like survive the roundup to be able to um, produce a new generation of resistant crops. And so I don't know if they're necessarily more adept, but we're applying a stronger selection and they um, reproduce faster and have shorter life cycles. Okay, thank you. Um, that was great. Could you talk a little bit about uh, translating findings from model systems to agricultural plants, since that's kind of the end goal here and like the sort of pipeline for that? Definitely. So I work with a Arabidopsis, which is the model plant, but it truly is a weed. You can grow it inside of a lab. It's like definitely not a crop that anyone's interested in eating. And so any findings that I would produce in like where the mutations are happening, if mutation rate is responsive to pathogens, that is a very like basic biology question. A lot of other people in my lab work on more traditional crop systems. Like we have people not working on wheat, we have people working on maize. And so starting to kind of broadly take information about how plants evolve themselves and what the mutation rate looks like in plants can help engineer new binding receptors with the eventual goal of like a plant vaccine model. And so in terms of taking my work and moving it into an actual crop system, I think that's what it would look like. If we're able to understand some of these basic tenets of how plants evolve at the protein level, being able to engineer new receptors that can bind to new diseases and somehow applying them to plants or engineering them in plants would be how you translate this to a more relevant crop system, something we actually eat. Okay, we have another question coming in here. Um, 
Joseph is asking whether you think plants are smarter than most people realize. Um, <laughs> smarter in quotes, yes. so take that as you will. Absolutely. I, I think plants are much smarter than we realize. I think my like big, big hypothesis that I won't be able to study in my PhD, but like hopefully in like 20 years, I'll be vindicated. I think plants have an immune system that's much closer to ours than we realize. So we have an adaptive immune system in which, you know, we create antibodies when there's new diseases and that's like they circulate around and that's how we're able to, you know, get vaccines, respond to new diseases we haven't seen before. Um, plants don't have an adaptive immune system in the same way. They don't have immune cells. They don't have, as far as we know, that sort of same mechanism of generating diversity. But I think that there might be something a little more similar than we realize going on. And so in that way, I think plants are way smarter than we realize and much closer to us and will help us understand our own human biology if we're able to kind of crack that code. So definitely. Cool. Well, we'll look out for yeah the generations of research that may be built in that hypothesis. Um, I also have another question to round out. I am not very versed in plant biology but I understand that there are some different cell types, like it's not all one type of cell. Um, obviously humans are much more organized into like organs and different tissue types. So we do have a specific like organ for immune cell production. Does, do plants have a specific cell type that is better at responding to infections or not? Or do they all kind of have their own um, ways to go about it? Definitely. The spatial organization, plants do have a complex spatial organization, but you're right, they don't have specialized immune cells the way we do. Um, the roots are encountering a lot more bacteria and fungi than the leaves are, but a lot of those are beneficial. You may have heard of mycorrhizal fungi that really help boost plant growth, and they like are in this really nice symbiotic relationship. And so another big question is like, how do plants differentiate like friendly bacteria and fungi from the enemy since that's a really interesting area. Um, but the roots themselves, since they're a more active area of pathogen colonization, like they definitely are like better suited than maybe like the stalks and the shoots, which are more developed for like passaging water and nutrients back and forth through the plant. And then a lot of pathogen infection does play out on the leaves because of the stomata, the gas pores that allow for gas exchange and also our entryways for pathogens. And so a lot of those leaf cells are more suited to, or at least more suited in the sense that they have different genes being transcribed to like be able to defend themselves against pathogens. Then maybe like a flower that's like transient and just would reproduce. So they do have spatial organization of these different tasks, but not like they have a T cell floating around like, that sort of thing. Cool, thank you. All right. Well, if there are no other questions coming in through the q and and the chat, we might round out this session, but of course, uh, we are always contactable and I think both of our speakers are happy to take questions uh, later. Their contact info and Twitter should be available um, on our website, um, as well as I think our uh, after seminar email. So one final thank you both to Monica and Chandler. These have been a super cool pair of talks, uh, really cool how paired they were. So we got to kind of see plant immunity from a bunch of different angles. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, and thank you for everyone in attendance uh, for being here and joining in. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all for organizing. Of course.